hi everyone. Thank you for being with us. Um, Nomadland, as Lisa mentioned, is our centerpiece film. It is, I think, already one of the most acclaimed and anticipated films of this year. Winner of the Golden Lion in Venice of the People's Choice Award in Toronto. Uh, we are very proud to have this film as our centerpiece. Uh, thank you to our friends at Searchlight. I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by two guests today. We have the writer and director of the film, Chloe Zhao. Uh, Chloe was in the main slate a few years ago with the writer. Uh, very happy to have you back in the festival, Chloe. Thank you. Thank you. Very happy to be back. And we also have with us one of the film's producers, Peter Spears. Um, Peter actually was along with uh, Francis McDormand, another producer, and of course the star of the film, uh, was the one who optioned the book Nomadland um, by Jessica Bruder, and so was instrumental in getting this project off the ground. So thank you for being with us, Peter. Thank you for having us. Sorry Francis couldn't join us today. Um, so I am, I'm gonna start with just a question that I think could be posed to, to both of you which is about just this process of translating a nonfiction book uh, into a narrative film. Um, in some ways, Chloe, this is maybe not such a stretch for you because you've made narrative films that have very strong documentary elements. But I'm, I'm curious about your initial reaction to the book. Um, and I'm also curious about yours, um, Peter, as, as, as you know, someone who optioned the book, what struck you as as cinematic uh, about, about the story? Um, well, I'll, I'll jump in just because we, I, I know that we got it rolling by, uh, my, the, the book was uh, sent to me uh, actually early on by uh, uh, my husband, Brian Swartstrom, uh, who was, had, had seen a blurb about it and he sent it to me and he also sent it to Francis uh, McDormand, he represents Francis and he, uh, had thought it might be something we would spark to. We had both we both read it and and loved it. Uh, I think originally we had thought that the movie would be something in an adapted screenplay situation, something that where Francis might play a Linda May herself. We would fix you know let that Francis. There was an idea that Francis would uh, bring to life Linda's life as it's depicted in the book. Uh, but about that time, we, uh, well, Frances actually was at the Toronto Film Festival with uh, three billboards, and uh, she sort of slipped away from press uh, uh, responsibilities and uh, <laughs> <laughs> what to do. And uh, she saw the writer, and she texted me after seeing the writer. She said, "I think we, uh, I think I, I, I may have just seen the person who's going to be perfect for this movie for uh, Nomadland." So. Uh, I saw it also, uh, and then we met with uh, with Chloe, uh, sort of in the midst of all that. Chloe had the writer coming out. I had Call Me By Your Name. She was doing three billboards, and we found a moment to all get together and to talk about this. And almost immediately, uh, Chloe had this spark and this idea that that the adaptation would not necessarily be just this idea of turning Linda May's life uh, into a cinematic treatment, but that she wanted to explore something even deeper and, uh, and, and larger in, in the landscape of that. Uh, and she began the process, you know, of taking the baton from us and we along together sort of began this journey with her uh, toward the movie that you see now. Yes, <laughs> everything Peter just said. Uh, and, and also, you know, when I, I remember meeting Fran and Peter for the first time, and it's just that there's a, when I meet someone I'm very unique, you know, when I, when I meet someone like Fran as well, it, it's, it's the excitement I get, same when I meet Linda May and Swanky and Bob Wells when I travel out there to meet them. You, you, you meet people that just have the spark in their eyes and have stories in their lives. And, and then it gets me excited, you know? So from the very beginning, which is what we said, how do we uh, create a, a, a narrative, a fictional character and a journey for her that we can incorporate organically all these incredible characters that Jessica has met through her research? Right. So could you say a little bit um, about creating this character of Thurn then and how much of it is drawn on Frances McDormand? I mean, like even the, you know, the, the name suggests that there's a, an affinity there, um, you know, you, you, uh, the Fran Fern uh, 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 kinship, uh, and I, 
you also are used, you, you, you have this now in three films have worked with non-professional actors and you seem to look for actors who bring something of themselves to the role. So I, I'm curious about how you created this very important fictional character to, to guide you through, you know, often very documentary environments. I think so much is a collaboration with Fran, you know, and, and uh, it, it, I think it was the first meeting, Peter, she said, you know, when I hit this age, I'm going to change my name to Firm. Yeah. Uh, smoke lucky strikes and drink wild turkey and hit the road. And I said, that's what the character should be called, right, Fur? And she's like, okay. <laughs> so that's, that's it, you know, and, and I'll, from, from something that, you know, of a name to, you know, what's the, what's the pattern of, of a plate, you know, the story of the, the plate that, that got broken in the movie um, is actually something, is, is the same set of plays that her dad gave her when she first graduated from school. All these photographs you see in the film, they're from friends real life, you know, and she would go to Salvation Army and find the costumes and um, <clears throat> and with RDP was our production designer as well, would just work with friends like, where would you leave your five gallon bucket, you know, what kind of bread would you make when you make your peanut butter jelly sandwich and, 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 and stories about um, even relationships she has with her sister. And that's also so much inspired by um, the, the casting of, of, of that character as well. You know, it's someone, <clears throat> it's like friends, uh, best, one of her best friends uh, that they went to college acting school together, Melissa Smith. So, you know, and Dave is, is friend's neighbor, you know, and, and it, it's, so, it's, she, it's so much of her in that character. That's, that process excites me. Um, there are actually uh, some questions already coming in, and, and there's a question about actors and non-actors, so let me pose this to you. It's from um, Akemi Nakamura, Cut Magazine. Uh, Chloe, you work so beautifully with non-actors on the writer. For this film, I could not tell who's actors and who's, who, who, are, who are actors and who are not non-professional actors, who are telling uh, life stories and um, which of those are scripted. Um, is there, can you distinguish between what was scripted uh, and what was not? Well, first of all, thank you. That's a, that's a great compliment. Um, probably one of the best I've ever got. So, uh, to, to, you know, because we, we really, the whole, the entire company, a filmmaking team, every decision we made is so much of how do we blend uh, a friend into a fern into the world of, that, that we went into. Um, it, it's, what do you say, Peter? Like, what, what's the percentage? Um, I, you know, it's almost like everyone's playing a version of themselves. So, yeah, I think that it is, uh, I mean, it's the magic for, for me, I, I didn't come from this non, uh, you know, this nonfiction world of filmmaking. Uh, and so to come into this world and have to see how Chloe creates this magic and creates this space on the set where the real professional actor and the non-professional actor are seamlessly not just seamless in their performance, but seamless in the way they're living their lives just day in, day out, you know, uh, sharing our lives and, and, and eating together and staying together. I mean, you know, literally Frances also sometimes would stay in her van and, and, and Chloe as well and uh, with camping with the folks we were working with. So we really were certainly embedded amongst them, but we really became a part of that community. And, and as much as I know they learned from the professional actors, we learned from them as well and really helped as well that we had, you know, uh, a very uh, succinct and trimmed down crew uh, where everybody was, was wearing multiple hats so that we could really be stealth in the way we were and, and non-invasive in this community. But having also like, you know, the producing partners of Molly Asher and, and Dan Jambi, who Molly's worked with Chloe on, two, on her two previous movies. So she had a lot of experience uh, with this. Dan comes from, uh, the world of Ben Zeitling and, and, and knows how to also working with real people to uh, make them find their most organic and, and, and real selves and most comfortable selves. And then Chloe's ability to capture that uh, on film was really, really remarkable uh, to see come together. Mm. Chloe, can you say a bit more about this interest that you have in um, working with non-professional actors? I mean, it's something that has there's a long history of it in, in cinema, um, going, you know, Italian neorealism mm -hmm. and, and, and all that, but um, it's not, 
it's not exactly common, uh, I think, in, in sort of Hollywood films or, you know, even American independent uh, films these days. So, but you've done it in all your films. Uh, and I'm wondering if that's something that you've always had, like, um, or is this something that you discovered, you know, in when you were at like Pine Ridge, you know, and, and encountering the subjects of your first two films? I think at the beginning it, it came out of necessity because because when when you especially if you go to a place that that hasn't been shot a lot and and I, I went to Pine Ridge and I I just couldn't imagine anybody could play the kids that's ended up in the film. I don't know where to find them. I didn't have the resources to do that kind of wild range of casting. And I was going to communities that's, that's not really my own, um, I guess, uh, you can put it like that. And, and, and that collaboration with them is so important to bring authenticity to the characters. So, and I just thought, why not just cast the real thing? Um, and then and then I learned very much of, of, of how, but by most of the time, mistakes I've made by, you can't just go out there and just shoot whatever you want and expect there's a movie, you know? And I learned that this is the third third time, hopefully I've gotten better, how, how, how to, do that and still have a structure a movie that's going to sustain people's attention and there's a there's a um, uh, there's a, a journey an arc emotional arc that can that can hold people and and that's that's the that's a constant um, challenge that that I'm still learning how to do I guess a question that's related to that uh, from Sidant Adlaka, a first post uh, for Chloe. What's your process like for getting first time actors in a comfortable conversational space where they're able to be so free flowing and naturalistic? I think, I think you just listen, you know, you'd be surprised if you, if you just sit there and listen to someone and maybe not tell them too much of what you think they should be or, 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 or uh, too much of your opinion about the world and who they are in the world or, and, and, but just let them tell you uh, and just listen. And, 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 and you do that long enough, uh, they're gonna feel comfortable telling you their stories. And you have to, like Peter just said earlier, you have to create an ecosystem. Uh, ecosystem of, of crew and cast and just just the overall um, sort of the divide of of, of, um, of the set that they feel like they're they're part that we're part of their world not the other way around so so we always say you cast your crew as you cast your actors very important um, and how does someone like Fran fit into this you know as it's so the first time working with a movie star. <laughs> Um, you know, and I think one of the achievements of this film is just like the integration of obviously a great actor, but also like a very recognizable screen presence into mm -hmm. this, this world. Um, what, what happens in scenes where you have Fran with a non-actor? Is, is she in some ways like kind of a, helping you direct them or, or, or do you see it that way or, you know? I think the, the, the most important thing that the friend could do in moments like that is truly be present mm -hmm. and, and be able to listen to them and guide them in a way that not necessarily, hey, you should act this way. Let me tell you about what I've learned acting. No, but she's pulling them in with her ability to engage and, and her facial expression. She's being sympathetic. She's, and she knows what I want in the scene. She knows where her character should be. So she's really reacting and she's not even very hard to do, I think, imposing something that she felt her, her character should do in the moment. Because a lot of times the non-professional actor might end up going off the arc of the scene because they felt like they should be talking about something and they're just being authentically themselves. Unless um, I think um, of an actor would end up imposing their moment anyways, what friend is able to do is, is then shift in the moment, but yes, still being completely present and staying in character with them. And that is like, that's the 24 seven job she did for like five months. It's ex incredibly difficult and exhausting because you have to constantly be fully present. And that, if anybody who, who felt when a loved one or someone that listened to you fully present, it's a great gift for you. And I think that's how she can best help me in those moments to get the unprofessional actors to open up in the scene. Yeah. Uh, it's a question from 
Adam Shartoff of Filmwax Radio. In, in your research for the characters, did you find that people identified with the term nomad or not? Did you find that many of the nomad experienced loss um, like a number of the characters in your film? Peter, what's the term that, that, that people loved? It's not nomads, is it? Uh, well, they're the different groups. In, in the yeah. band boilers, when, when uh, boilers. They're the travelers. That was another sort of mm -hmm. subculture. Um, they, uh, there's different, there's just different groups uh, living out the, amongst, uh, in, in the same sort of way and their paths do cross. Um, mm -hmm. But they, uh, I, I think that a lot of that research too came from Jessica's book uh, where she as well is able to show a, a good cross section of that. And um, I don't know that it feels I mean, clearly this movie is about loss uh, and the loss of, and for Fern especially, um, it's, you know, it's just a, there's some gr grief she's dealing with, but it doesn't feel like necessarily the people living out that way and in the research. I, I mean, when you, Chloe, went out to go do the research, uh, mm -hmm. also when you were writing the script and you were sending messages back, kind of missives mm -hmm. back of photos and, and uh, people you were meeting and little moments and things like, it was, it was all very hope. I mean, there's a lot of hope and there was a lot of uh, life and, uh, and sort of very much felt uh, like she was tapping into something very deep and, and meaningful uh, and, and very American. And, and also, you know, you, you, the, 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 you might feel like, oh, there's a, there's a lot of loss in the, in the, on top of the hope and the resilience that, that, that we encounter. I think it's also an age thing, you know. I think that's that's something that that, that Bob Wells has said to me when we first met. He's like, it's just, the thing is like the the, the band dwellers I work with, they're usually in their later part of their lives, and it, and if you, it's very different than the van life, the, the younger the younger person's world and the older person's world are very different. Um, and and in the in Bob said, you know, I just met everyone has experienced some kind of loss that's not like a specific to a time. It's just a human loss when you get to an older age and a loved one dying or losing somebody is because we don't live forever. Um, and, and you just have more life experience. And so that, that might be something that's seeping through that people are feeling. Right. Um, we have a couple of questions about the uh, the many hats that Chloe wore, uh, a couple of people noted that you also edited the film. Uh, Jeff Ewing from Forbes uh, wants to know about the editorial process and a more, uh, a comment from Jeremy Fassler, Columbia Journalism School, uh, says he was blown away by the editing in the film. Um, almost every scene feels like you're dropping in to see a snippet of something larger uh, and we cut away uh, to another scene without the rhythm feeling choppy or arbitrary. So couple of questions about editing, um, if you want to oh, speak about so, that, Chloe. That's so nice, because I have a feeling most people think it's choppy. <laughs> I appreciate that, I like that. Uh, <laughs> um, we, it, it, it was actually because the pen, you know, we, we had a, a quarantine as well. So initially I just thought, I'm just gonna do it myself. Um, and then if I do end up needing to branch out, we would, but, but the pandemic made it easier for me to just do it myself. And, I work very closely to the producers and, and to, to the execs at Searchlight and, and the notes they've given me through the process is super helpful because I'm it's so insulated to, to write, direct, and then edit uh, in your little quarantine room. So, um, you know, with, uh, the whole process was about, what do you think, Peter, two to three months? It was pretty, pretty quick. Um, and that, that comes from having collaborated also with my cinematographer, like two times in a row now. We kind of know how we're going to cover in a way that we, we know that the style of editing is going to, to, because if you edit this film traditionally, we don't have the footage for it. So, you know, the, the style is, is, is determined by the way we shot the film. Right. Uh a couple of questions about music. Um, one from Alessandra Rangel. Could Chloe talk a little bit about how you incorporate music in the movie and your collaboration with Ludovico Ainaudi? Uh, and another question from Anne-Catherine uh, Titsa about um, 
scene for, where she first sees a uh, singer-songwriter Cat Clifford uh, and the Cowboys uh, off in <laughs> the distance, connects Neil Madeline with the writer, and then we hear her song again during the end credits. Um, did you write Drifting Away I Go for the film? So two questions about the score and, and also that use of music. You guys ask the best questions. I love this. Uh, <laughs> first of all, to Cat. Cat exists in my little cinematic universe of South Dakota. He's been on my three films. Um, and um, he played a guitar in every single of them and he plays a song in the end. Now, Drifting Away is a song that um, that day, Cat and the Cowboy showed up. I said, you got a song to play on camera? And then he's like, okay, what about this? And he showed me on his iPhone. And it's something that is not something he wrote for a film. It's just something he had, he, he's recorded and he has on SoundCloud. I was like, oh, that's a good one. So he played and then on camera. And then as we were thinking of an ending song, you know, Peter was like, I, I think there's an opportunity because he, Peter actually was so moved by, by the, the boys' performance on that day on the cliffs and then loved how that music and Ludovico's piano for some reason has this really interesting um, cross. And he actually really, Peter really encouraged me to, to explore having cast song at the end of the film, but, but it was very stripped down. So we worked with our music editor to collaborate with another musician and to do a different rendition for the, for the, for the ending. So I really like that you noticed that. Uh, I have actually not physically worked with Ludovico and I hope I get that opportunity someday. Uh, a lot of filmmakers I really admire use um, <clears throat> pre-composed music, uh, use existing score for their films. So that was my first idea. And it was literally, I Googled beautiful classical music inspired by nature on the internet. And, uh, and then Ludovico's um, YouTube video of, um, it's called the Elegy uh, of the Arctic, of him playing piano on a, on a floating platform in the Arctic Ocean. And it's just this really singular, beautiful uh, piano piece. And then you see the ice. A collapsing behind him from the mountains and I was like oh this is, I felt something you know and then the seven days walking album where he wrote seven albums inspired by the seven days of his the same walk he took on the Alps um, and so every element from golden butterfly to low mist to gravity you know and when I was hearing that music I was feeling that even though these two people Fern and Ludwiko are on two different ends of the world and very different life experiences but their connection to nature and the, the, the way they find themselves in nature actually connect them as humans. So for some reason that music just, just fit perfectly and I was so grateful for it. Question uh, from Stevie Wong, Sky News Backstage for Chloe. Sometimes it felt like Fern's role was to reflect these stories told to her. Were there any surprises during these scenes where you kept the camera rolling and ended up in the final cut? Did Frances ever break character because she was surprised by what was unfolding? Are we going to have a bloopers reel, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> For the DVD. Uh, I mean, we all like crack up sometimes, and, and that's good, actually. That really helps like, sometimes lighten the mood. and, and um, Surprises, yeah. I mean, full of it, right, Peter? Like, full of surprises. And, and uh, yeah. I think that was the beauty of, of uh, Chloe's mm -hmm. uh, idea and the work of her screenplay and everything is that it allowed for the breathing space of surprises. That was the whole, that was the goal was to have uh, the structure there so that when the surprises happened, they could be integrated into into the story and used and feel uh, and, and often lead us on whole new directions uh, mm -hmm. that we you know, to explore, um, which is part of the reason it took four months, you know, to make to make the movie because we were exploring a lot. Yeah, know. like we went for Derek, for example. Yeah, it's a surprise, huge surprise. Derek, um, who plays Derek in the you know the young drifter in the film, we we, we met him uh, as we're shooting, right, Peter? It was like. Derek, and then uh, I was like, oh, wow, he should be in the movie. And he so hops the, trains, rides trains, <laughs> hops trains across America, and yeah. uh, he just ended up uh, becoming a part of the movie. And also, we get worked on the movie for a bit as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a whole month. As an art, art department assistant, the only one who knows how to really fix a car. For <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
uh, Randy Jones is asking if there were any shots or locations that were difficult to capture uh, during principal photography. I mean, the film does cover quite a lot of terrain, geographically speaking. What would you say, Peter, was the toughest part of the shoot, just physically, I guess? Um, there was, I mean, the, the beet harvest was, was difficult. There's a lot, I mean, we were, that's literally a beet harvest with hundreds mm -hmm. of trucks lined up for miles coming in to dump their beats and we're trying to move cameras and nobody is particularly used to having a camera around and uh, Francis is, you know, trying to be focused on that as well. So I, for me, my, I felt most anxious during that period of shooting. Uh, the other ones felt like we could settle into the rhythm of the place, uh, the yeah. rhythm of the empire, the rhythm of, of the Badlands is, you know, a little more low key uh, and allowed for us to breathe a bit. But that was, that was a remarkable time to shoot. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Can you talk more about the selection of the locations and sort of map, how you mapped the film? Well, we, want, we knew we wanted to be in the American West. I think we covered most of the landscape, maybe except um, Canyon, like the Grand Canyon, that, that, that area in Utah. Um, I, I think it's a combination of what Jessica already has researched and got in her book based on the, the itinerary of the seasonal uh, jobs uh, and the mixture of that and, and, all, and then, you know, Corsair, Arizona, where it's like the, the headquarter um, and, and then just personal places like uh, South Dakota for me and very much like uh, the Northern California calls for Fran. Um, those, those are our two loves and we include those in the film as well. A question from Rebecca Polly of Box Office Pro. Have Bob Wells, Linda May, Swanky, and the others seen the film yet? And if so, what has their reaction been? Yeah, Peter, I'll let you have that one. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they were there uh, at the, um, the screening, at the Telluride screening at the Rose Bowl a couple weeks ago. And uh, I, I think they were uh, very moved by the experience. Uh, I mean, I think in the way that you can imagine, we got, you know, we heard back from all of them recently, like, could they see it again? Because it was so much to take in, they couldn't quite, you know, process it all. Uh, and so uh, it was a lot going on that night with the screening and there were the fires happening around the Rose Bowl at the same time and everything. So, um, Anyway. That's a YouTube video, but the, we should share it more. We have a YouTube video of the event, and they you, you can hear a little bit of their thoughts. And, um, it's, it's yeah, a, and they it's came up video. on the stage and spoke afterwards and uh, mm -hmm. to the people there. And, and seeing them speaking to the crowd, and the crowd mm -hmm. was the cars, and the cars honking and their lights flashing. You, you know you're mm -hmm. doing the same thing for the drive-ins now with, the, with your festival. Uh, was was very moving. They spoke very elo eloquently about their, their um, experiences both in the in the movie and out of the movie. And uh, I think it's an experience all of us who were there won't won't ever forget. Yeah. To watch them watch the movie. Uh, a question from Tom Brook of the BBC. Uh, we're living in tumultuous times: a pandemic, economic <laughs> meltdowns, racial injustice, a polarizing president. Um, how, to you, how does this affect the way in which people interpret the film? It doesn't, to, to me, how I would go in to make a film as a filmmaker is always, how do I best present a human, authentic human experience for you as an audience? And, and, and then what, which, you know, audience from all over the world with a different, they coming into the theater with their own different conditioning, their own different uh, life experiences. And I'm always excited to find out what they take away uh, from it. And um, obviously the time we live in will influence how they see things. But I don't think I can generalize what I think has changed for because audiences are very different based on who they are. Um, question from Brianna Ziegler, Screen Queens. There's a subtle through line in the film of environmentalism uh, and a, a human being's unquestionable connection to the earth, which feels extremely pertinent uh, today. Um, were you at all thinking about the conversation around climate change when making this film? Well, I think everyone on the team is a love of nature. I hope like that come, <laughs> that come across, you know, and, and I think when, when you, um, 
when you are forced out of your houses and your cities and you're, you're living in a vehicle and a lot of times you, 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 you might not be a nature's person, but you, you get to understand a lot more of, of what nature does. And it's not just beauty and, and it's, it's a, a beautiful sunset, but it's also the storms and the harshness and, and the, the weather. The, it just humbles you as a human being that you feel like not only that all your, the things you think is a problem and, and um, uh, when you see a, a huge lightning storm coming, you, you look at the person next to you, it, you, you realize you're human beings first. You gotta help each other out. You know, it's less about what you believe or president you vote for. Um, and that to me, that, that, that power of nature is some, to me so important. And we, about, we obviously should protect it. Um, and I, I think hopefully at this time now, this film does inspire people to go out there and check out how beautiful the, the rest of the country is. And Peter, I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I think that was the lesson of, I, I mean, you know, I'm a city guy and, you know, grew up and, and live my life on the city and whatever, but I, 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 the experience of being there and being in nature and amongst nature and with the people who are living this way, just, just so tapped me into our shared humanity. And that was, uh, and, and, and that was really the takeaway. And, and it was, mm -hmm. uh, I know Francis says, has used the word that the experience was humbling. And, and it was, it was uh, humbling and it was an honor and it was uh, one of, you know, sort of the, the great experiences of, of, my, of my professional life and personal life. I think we're at about, at about half an hour. So I think I'm just gonna squeeze in one final question, which also has to do with nature um, since we're on that subject. Uh, Chloe, is this your new world a la Terrence Malick? This is from Siddhant Adlaka, your ode to nature. And can you say more about your relationship to the outdoors as uh, somebody who has moved from place to place? I will always wish my film could be the new world. <laughs> I'll keep making films hoping it'll be like that. I just, I love that movie. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Terry has inspired me greatly. I, I think it's, a, it's very obvious and, and he's, um, using cinematic language to explore um, our connection with the things that are beyond us and what, what connects us all that that that, that I just yeah I look up to to, to his uh, his way of filmmaking and I, I try to learn as much as possible but in 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 terms of um, my uh, I was a city person too just like um, Peter you know I, I beside Beijing LA New York London and um, I think it's when I hit my late 20s and I just felt I felt something was missing and and that that got me to go west to South Dakota from New York. And it, it is this feeling, and I grew up uh, without religion as well, you know, and it is this feeling of like, why are we here? You know, what's the meaning of it all? Uh, I mean, don't think about that when you're younger. And then your own mortality, you know, um, um, and, uh, I, and then when I went out to South Dakota and I, I saw the landscapes that are, that are so ancient because it's ranching land, right? You, you don't even, it's not even farmed. So you touch that dirt and that animal bone has been there for, for so long. And, and then you look up, you, you see that lightning storm come, you understand where the, the Lakotas might have had the, you know, the, the thunder gods and the great, the, the great spirit come from. So that's something I just didn't understand when I was growing up. And I felt like I, I become a more wholesome person, healthier person, uh, having been out there uh, for this long. Uh, and it made me who I am as the filmmaker today. I think that's a good note to end on. Um, thank you everyone for your questions. Uh, thank you, Chloe. Thank you, Peter. Congratulations on this wonderful film and we're excited for New York to see it tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.